Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, we're delighted to welcome Dr. Robert Jones to Notre Dame as our culminating event in our inaugural series of the ND Democracy Talks. My name is Claudia Francis. I'm the Associate Director for the Rooney Center of the Study of American Democracy. The ND Democracy Talks are a new initiative for the Rooney Center, and it's in partnership with the Hesburgh Program in Public Service, which is an academic minor for students. The goal of these talks is to offer many lessons in key concepts for understanding democracy so that students and the broader Notre Dame community can be better informed citizens. And our tagline is that we like to create a community of people who will champion democracy. Um, so I'd like to thank our student assistant, Nicholas Crookston, for really helping me get this um, from an uh, idea into reality. So thank you very much, Nicholas. So tonight's talk is Struggle for the Country's Soul, Christian Nationalism in a Changing America, featuring Dr. Robert Jones. He's the president and founder of Public Religion Research Institute, also known as PRRI, and along with uh, professors Dave Campbell and Jeffrey Lehman. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Jones is a leading scholar and commenter on religion, culture, and politics. He is the author of the forthcoming book, The Hidden Roots of White Supremacy and the Path to a Shared American Future as well as White Too Long, The Legacy of White Supremacy in American Christianity, which won a 2021 American Book Award and is also available for purchase this evening. He holds a PH, oh, my notes, pardon me. He holds a PhD in religion from Emory University and a Master's of Divinity from Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary and a BS in Computing Science and Mathematics from Mississippi College. Dr. Jones is frequently featured in major national media, such as CNN, MSNBC, NPR, The New York Times, and The Washington Post, and we are grateful to have him here with us this evening. Our esteemed colleagues and experts on religion and politics, Dave Campbell and Jeff Lehman, co-authors of Secular Surge, A New Fault Line in American Politics, will offer commentary and e insights to further put into context the role that religion plays in American democracy. And tonight we'll be sure to have time for Q&A this evening. And uh, afterwards, you're welcome to mingle and enjoy some light refreshments. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Jones. Thanks, everybody. Um, oh, I can turn myself on here. OK, better? Um, OK. Great. Well, uh, thank you all. Uh, this is my first time to Notre Dame's campus. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you to Jeff and David and Claudia and everyone else for um, uh, inviting me to be here with you today. Um, we have the very light topic uh, tonight of um, talking about the threat of uh, Christian nationalism uh, to American democracy. But I am very happy to be here um, uh, at an institution with religious roots uh, and talking about um, the health of democracy. It's really important. So I'm really happy to hear about this program uh, uh, tonight. And um, hopefully, we'll have a, a very robust uh, conversation. So thanks uh, to you all for coming. Um, so I'm just going to start with uh, some, uh, some data. So what I'm going to show you, I'm going to kind of set the table with a set of slides from uh, some recent demographic studies uh, that PRRI, it's the Public Religion Research Institute um, uh, in Washington, DC, that, um, that I'm uh, president and founder of, uh, uh, has gathered over the years. So some kind of demographic data for context, and then some specific data from a survey that we released with the Brookings Institution um, earlier this year, trying to measure and quantify um, uh, what we, you've seen a lot of ink spilled in the media, but how about we talk about it in a quantitative way? What does it really mean for someone to affirm uh, a kind of worldview of Christian nationalism? Um, so first of all, let me just set uh, the table with some context. Um, I, I do think this movement is really, and, and for um, especially understanding the rise of uh, this movement, it's, it's really necessary to understand the context of, uh, of the changing American uh, religious landscape, particularly in terms of race and religion. Uh, here. So um, I'm going to put this, this start with one slide, and I can maybe explain all of it from uh, the context from this one slide, uh, but because I like numbers, I'm going to show you more than one. Um, but uh, here's, here's the first one. Um, so um, in 2016, I wrote a book called The End of White Christian America, um, and I was looking at the demographic change, particularly um, in the 2000s forward, um, and I noticed that something um, peculiar had happened or, or notable had happened during uh, the presidency of our first African-American president, and that is the country had moved from 
from being a country that was majority white and Christian. And that is, if you take all white, non-Hispanic Christians, add them all together, Protestant, Catholic, non-denominational, etc., um, we were, uh, in, in 2008, uh, 54% white and Christian by that, by that definition. By the end of uh, Barack Obama's presidency, um, it had dropped uh, down to 43. It's kind of stayed around there. The, our last numbers from just last year that we just um, uh, kind of crunched, it's down, it's at 42. Uh, percent. So if you think about that, going from 54 to 42 percent um, just since 2008, that's a fairly rapid shift um, over um, a fairly small amount of time. And one other uh, measure I'm going to put here is not demographic, but it's public opinion measure across this time to kind of give you a sense of how quickly some um, just kind of cultural uh, attitudes have changed. Here is the support uh, for same-sex marriage um, over that same uh, period of time, right? Very dramatic change. So if you kind of roll back to the early 2000s, uh, one thing you see is the country is comfortably majority white and Christian. Most Americans oppose same-sex marriage. That's in the early 2000s, right? So just two decades ago. Today, um, that's been flipped on its head, right? Um, we're looking at nearly seven in 10 Americans supporting uh, same-sex marriage. And among the age of most of you in here, that number is up uh, almost at 80%. Uh, support and the number of white Christians has kind of is stabilized a bit, but it, it's down to 42% um, over this time period. So, uh, what does that look like in terms of uh, particular subgroups? This is the line that I think is the most important. This is the uh, chart of white evangelical Protestant affiliation um, over that same time period, 2006 uh, to 2022. We see it's about a quarter of the population as recently as uh, 2006. Our latest numbers from 2022 have white evangelicals down to 13.6% uh, um, of the population. Um, again, that's a fairly dramatic drop um, over a short amount of time. Uh, here are white mainline Protestants, that is the non-evangelical uh, Protestant um, world, think United Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian, uh, that end of the Protestant world, uh, declined as well, but they've largely stabilized since 2012 or so. Uh, and then here are white Catholics, uh, the other kind of major group in the kind of white Christian world. Again, some decline here, well, about four points uh, overall um, uh, across this period of time, but not as, nothing is as steep as this decline among white evangelical uh, Protestants. And I think that context is really important uh, for these last things. And here is the, speaking of secular surge, uh, right? Um, here are the number of, of uh, religiously unaffiliated in orange uh, here across there. Again, going down to about, uh, they were 16% um, in, in the early 2000s. Our, our last numbers have them at 20, uh, 27% um, of, of the public. So more than a quarter now of the public claiming no religious affiliation uh, whatsoever. So a very different uh, religious landscape. Um, overall, if you kind of put it together, here's what uh, the pie chart of major religious affiliation is uh, in the country, just so you can see it all in one place, uh, visually represented. All the kind of blue numbers are white Christian uh, majority groups. Here, again, only a little more than four in ten. About a quarter are Christians of color of various uh, kinds, uh, about 6% uh, non-Christian religious uh, groups, and there again is that 27% of uh, religiously unaffiliated folks uh, there. The other thing to kind of see here is what's going on by age. Uh, and you can really see uh, it quite dramatically. So you can maybe think about this as kind of an archaeological dig down through generational strata, right? The lower we go, the younger uh, we get. Uh, so this is seniors, those age 65 and older here. And what you can see here, it's, it's, it's pretty dramatic. It, it's um, more than 6 and 10 uh, uh, are um, uh, some variety of white and Christian. If, and it, it just kind of stair steps down, right? If you get to Americans age 18 to 29, it's only about 3 and 10. Uh, who are white and Christian. So you can just see the generational uh, sh shifts here. And you also see it on the other end. Uh, I'll put up the religiously unaffiliated, right? So here are the unaffiliated, right? Among those same generational strata. And among the youngest Americans, uh, that is 38%. Um, who are religiously unaffiliated. We have never seen a generation in their 20s that unaffiliated before. So it, for example, even if you take the baby boomer generation back into their 20s, uh, they're only about 12% unaffiliated versus this, this generation, 38% uh, unaffiliated. So a lot of change here. Um, it's also not a bicoastal phenomenon. It's actually happening everywhere across the country. Um, so this is a snapshot of, um, I, just for one, one measure, people who identify as white, non-Hispanic, and Christian by state. Um, and just to kind of, you'll just see the pattern. You don't have to really see any of the numbers directly, but take a look at this pattern. It's a kind of a U-shaped pattern, right? You come down through the Midwest and then up the Appalachian Mountains with the highest levels 
of uh, percent white and Christian population, uh, the darkest blue means that 65% are over. Uh, are white and Christian in that in those states. Here's just uh, this isn't even the most updated, but here's like ten years later, the same states, right? Um, you see how few are, are continued to be blue, um, the sixty five percent or more. So I kind of go back, right? Ten years later, uh, this is what we see. So it really is happening everywhere, Indiana, Kansas, Oklahoma, um, kind of across the country. Um, these these changes are really being felt. Um, so I think that's the context, a kind of a changing country, um, and I, I think the sense of the country no longer being majority white and Christian is part of what set off um, a kind of reactionary movement that uh, uh, we've been talking about as Christian nationalism. So we set out um, building on a bunch of other people's work, particularly uh, Sam Perry, Andrew Whitehead, some others that have been doing work in political science on this to try to measure um, uh, white Christian national or Christian nationalism, and we we ended up using these five measures. We had a bunch of different measures that we tested out. These five correlated quite highly uh, together, um, and you can see here the percent of the general population that agree with each. I, I won't read them all, but just a couple. Um, uh, the U.S. government should declare America a Christian nation. If the U.S. moves away from our Christian uh, foundations, we will not have a country anymore. Our U.S. laws should be based on Christian values, right? So very straightforward uh, statements here. And uh, what we did is we built a scale out of these questions, which means that we weren't using just one of them, but all five of them together, and kind of added people's responses uh, to these questions together to come up with uh, a, a kind of combined composite measure of uh, affirmation of Christian nationalism. And then we um, combined these and in, in, in scored them, Americans, uh, on that combined measure and grouped them into these uh, kind of four groups. So I'll explain basically uh, Christian, who we call Christian nationalism adherents uh, were those who basically completely agreed with all of those statements, right? They're really uh, in full agreement there. That's about 10% of the country, right, that is in full agreement with all five of those statements. Uh, the next group is Christian nationalism sympathizers. These are groups who agreed, but not as strongly. Maybe they strongly agreed on some, uh, just agreed um, uh, somewhat strongly on the others. That's about another 19% of the country. So if you put these two groups together, Christian nationalism adherents and sympathizers, it's about three in 10 um, Americans who kind of lean that direction. Um, that means that the rest of the country um, leans kind of away from it. So about 39% uh, of the country uh, rejected it, but didn't reject, didn't strongly reject it. And then we have about 29% um, of the country that strongly disagreed with all five uh, statements. So that's kind of the balance. It's really about a two to one uh, balance leaning away uh, from from that from those views about um, uh, Christian nationalism, but about three in ten in the public. Now, uh, yeah, I think you can read this a couple of ways. Three in ten seems like maybe not that many. So why are we hearing so much about it um, in the public? And it's because it tends to be um, loaded on one side of our political uh, and religious uh, spectrum. Um, uh, before I get to that and unpacking that, let me, I do want to say one thing about the term. We also asked about the, so the term Christian nationalism because we did not use the term in building the scale. Right? We used those attitudinal measures, but we did also go ask people whether they had heard of the term and whether they had a positive or negative um, uh, view of the term. And what we found, in fact, is that those who uh, scored highly on those measures did in fact have a positive association with the terms. They basically claimed the term. They didn't just see it as a negative term being used against them. Uh, and you can kind of see the sympathizers uh, had, had also had more favorable views than the skeptics or the rejectors on the other side. However, there's a lot of Americans who haven't heard of it, right? So that's the gray here. Um, and it turns out that, the, that basically the more you don't like the term, the more you have heard about it. Um, in, in the public. So it's people who are uh, either the skeptics or rejectors who have heard most about the term and who have most negative um, associations with it. But, but notably, those who have heard of it and are adherents have a positive, uh, have a positive view of it. Um, so who, who, who are they? How does this, um, how does this stratify across uh, the public? Um, so here is um, religious, major religious groups in the country. I'm kind of put the first two sides up here, adherents and sympathizers. There's, there's really only one major religious group uh, where there is a majority who are in one of those two 
first categories, and that's white evangelical Protestants, right? 64% uh, of them are either uh, adherents, Christian nationalism adherents, or sympathizers. Uh, the other group, this other Protestants of color group, is mostly Asian American and Pacific Islander Protestants. It's actually a very small group. It's less than 3% of the country. Um, but everybody else is, is below majority uh, in terms of either adherents or sympathizers. White evangelical Protestants really do stick out. Um, I'll note also um, two Catholic groups here, white Catholics and Latino Catholics, are fairly low on the list. In fact, they look about like the general public uh, does. Is not not that distinctive here, but but white evangelicals really uh, stick out. Latino Protestants as well. Um, the gap between Latino Protestants and Latino Catholics here is quite large, um, and you can see that the kind of Latino Catholic numbers look much more like white evangelical uh, numbers um, uh, on this on this measure. Uh, there's the and there's the other side uh, to the question. The unaffiliated uh, Jews and other non-Christian religions, obviously the most. Uh, opposed uh, or lean most away from Christian nationalist views. Uh, the other thing we found um, is that um, there's been some uh, kind of push and pull in the literature about whether uh, people who are connected to churches, what role that has uh, uh, in their uh, political views. We're finding here that actually it is quite strongly linked to uh, religious attendance. That is, those who attend religious services more often are more likely to hold Christian nationalist views than those who attend uh, less often. This is even true inside of um, groups. There's, there's, very, there's actually little effect among, uh, among Catholics, but there's a stronger effect among white evangelicals in this direction, that, that the more likely you attend, the more likely you are uh, to hold um, uh, these views. And so you can see those who attend once a week or more here, about half of that group is either Christian nationalism adherents or sympathizers compared to many, much fewer among those who attend religious services seldom or never. Um, we also see a, a, a strong partisan divide, and we see this on a lot of measures. You can see that it's not even. Um, political scientists call this um, asymmetric polarization, right? So it's polarized, but not evenly, right? So independents aren't right in the middle. Independents look more, more like Democrats on this measure, um, uh, and it's, it's a majority. Uh, it's 54% of Republicans fall into one of these two uh, categories with uh, far fewer independents or Democrats um, affirming uh, cr Christian nationalism. There's the other side um, of, of the, these numbers. And then finally, the other place that we find that has a strong effect is media consumption, this particularly TV news. Uh, and we find that um, we, we've uh, long been tracking this at, at PRI. We find that uh, particularly uh, those who, are, who said they most trust Fox News or those who say they most trust other um, what we've labeled far-right news outlets, but these are Newsmax uh, and One American News, uh, which are typically a bit to the right of, of Fox. And you'll see the, um, you'll see the, the effect um, here, right? It, it, it's fairly strong uh, that, again, most, those who say they most trust Fox News, majority in the category, and those who say they most trust either One American News or Newsmax, um, really up there, it's nearly 8 in 10 um, who are either um, Christian nationalism adherents uh, or sympathizers. Again, here's the other side of that. You can see the um, uh, kind of mainstream news or like broadcast news or even don't watch TV are, are very unlikely. So it's telling us that, that those media channels are actually playing a role in structuring these views. Um, uh, in our longer presentation, I should say most of these slides are actually up on the PRI website. If you want to kind of go check them out, um, you can just go to PRI and you look for the Christian nationalism study that we conducted in February. Um, there's a whole set of slides showing these correlates. I'm not going to get into that now. I'm happy to discuss it. But we also found that um, Christian nationalist views and the Christian nationalism scale was positively correlated with uh, views of anti-black racism, with anti-immigrant views, with anti-Muslim views, anti-Semitism, and also with patriarchal gender roles and anti-LGBTQ uh, views. So it kind of comes along as a package uh, that these, these, uh, these views kind of hold together here. Um, so uh, the other thing I wanted to kind of point out here is what, what does this make on other kinds of measures that were about the um, like religious pluralism uh, and the idea of kind of an ethno-religious pluralism in the country. Uh, so uh, we had this paired uh, opposite question where we asked people, which of these two statements do you agree more with? Uh, and one of them is, I would prefer the U.S. to be a nation made up of people belonging to a wide variety of religions. The other one, I would prefer the U.S. to be ma a nation primarily made up of people who follow the Christian faith. In the country, it's about three to one. Uh, people saying the first thing, that they prefer to live in a religiously plural country. So that's 
Good for democracy. Um, that's a kind of nice affirmation of religious pluralism in the country. But when you look at those, this question by um, Christian nationalism uh, adherents, you see the opposite, right? Those who um, affirm Christian nationalism look exactly the opposite as most of the country does. They've got three quarters opposing that and saying we'd rather live in a Christian country. Uh, sympathizers are a little more divided, but still a majority uh, leaning in this side of saying they'd prefer to live um, in a country of uh, mostly Christians, and then you can see those who are um, skept Christian nationalism skeptics or rejectors far and away on the other side of the question. And then we have this question um, uh, that is really about uh, this this idea of some of you may have uh, uh, talked about this this thing called the doctrine of discovery, um, uh, right? In American history and in really pre-American history, European history. But we, I wrote this question uh, really uh, uh, thinking about that idea that, that uh, of America as a kind of promised land for European Christians. So it's an agree, disagree question. God intended America to be a new promised land where European Christians could create a society that could be the exa an example to the rest of the world. Uh, again, if you look at most of the country, um, it really is only about three in 10 who agree. Uh, with that statement. But if you look at adherents, Christian nationalists, adherents, and sympathizers, you can see very, very strong uh, agreement, which you'd expect uh, with, you know, with this, with this uh, thing. So even when we add in the idea of European Christianity, right, uh, not just Christianity, but kind of a promised land for European Christians, you can see it highly, um, those, those views are highly consistent with um, holding Christian nationalism views as well. And then finally, um, uh, we saw that, uh, some kind of disturbing uh, uh, things uh, about violence, about political violence. This question says, this again, agree or disagree question, because things have gotten so far off track, true American patriots may have to resort to violence in order to save our country. Um, we find, again, most Americans reject that idea. Only 16% of Americans agree with that. Uh, but among those who are Christian nationalism adherents, it goes to 40%. Uh, 40%. Uh, who agree with that. So 4 in 10 agree with that. Sympathizers, about 22%, and then it drops off uh, from there. So, um, uh, you know, this is one where I think, well, 40% is actually a fairly high number for a kind of resort to violence, right, to solve, to solve, our, uh, to solve our political differences. And I am going to land the plane right there, um, and we can see where we want to go. Okay, thank you very much, Robbie. That was a, a great talk and um, I think very thought provoking to, to put some actual numbers on something that we all know is going on. Um, uh, professor Campbell and I both decided that we wouldn't talk very long, but we're political science professors, so we'll be here a couple hours. <laughs> Settle in. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I just want to say a few things, and, and one, before I forget it, on, on the violence piece, which is clearly pretty disturbing, um, um, I've just been rereading a piece by uh, in the journal Political Behavior. I say rereading it because I used to be the editor and I actually accepted this piece, uh, but I'm assigning it for class, so this time I'm really reading it. Um, a piece by uh, Miles Armali, uh, David Buckley, and um, uh, Adam Enders um, about this link between Christian nationalism and violence, and and they they show e exactly what um, what Robbie just showed, um, but they have this interesting argument about things that sort of condition the effect of Christian nationalism on support for political violence. Um, and it's, um, you know, Christian nationalism itself uh, is a mainspring for political violence. It, it leads to greater support for violence, but it's particularly powerful in combination with other sort of orientations like a strong white identity, mm -hmm. um, a strong feeling that whites uh, as a group need to fight for the rights of whites, which of course is also highly correlated with anti-black racism. Um, it's also another factor that kind of lends power to Christian nationalism is consumption of sort of conspiratorial or far right media. Um, and then a third thing is perceived victimhood, feeling like you yourself is a victim. Um, in combination with all of those things, Christian nationalism 
um, is a particularly strong um, pr pusher um, of uh, support for political violence and support for uh, believing that the January 6, 2021 insurrection at the Capitol uh, needed to be done. The worrisome thing is that Christian nationalism is also positively correlated with all those things. Christian nationalists are more likely to think of themselves as victims. They're more likely to be anti-black racists and to have a strong white identity. Um, and um, they're more likely to consume sort of far right, often conspiratorial news sources. They're, they're much more likely to believe in QAnon, for example. Um, and so in some sense, I think the numbers that we've seen about support for political violence among Christian nationalists may even be an underestimate or, or perhaps not as alarming as they should be because when combined with these other things, it's, it's sort of a powder keg. Um, another thing I'll say, um, w Dave and I sort of in our recent research have come from the perspective of the opposite end of the American religious and cultural spectrum, examining this growth of the nuns, the non-religious, but particularly of what we call secularists, people who are not just non-religious, but um, sort of have a positive, affirmative commitment to secularist values, science, evidence, rationalism. Um, we think we're the only ones who have really measured that, so we don't have a long time series on this, but we would say that's, it, nuns are about almost 30% of the country now. Secularists are probably 10, 12, 15% of the country. So we are increasingly divided into about a third, 25% to a third are Christian nationalists or at least sympathizers. And now 15% and growing are true secularists who not only are not religious, but embrace a non-religious way of viewing the world through science, humanism, evidence. So if you wonder why we're polarized, um, that's a large part of why we're polarized, is we have groups that are viewing the world, human existence, through an entirely different lens and an incompatible lens. Um, I guess the last thing I'll say, and then I'll let Professor Campbell talk, is um, in the last chapter of our book, Secular Surge, um, we talk about what I just talked about, polarization and the, the disjuncture between, um, you know, committed tr religious traditionalists, evangelical Protestants um, and secularists. But we also talk about bridges that can be built. Secularists care about things that um, many uh, committed Catholics care about, the environment, human rights, uh, anti-poverty, uh, anti-food poverty. Um, so there are some opportunities for bridge building, but when you talk about Christian nationalists, it's kind of hard to see those bridges being built between an increasingly non-religious population and this core of people who uh, strongly believe and are ready to fight to defend the idea of America as a, as a fundamentally Christian country. So on that happy note, I will... <laughs> <laughs> Yes, you can always trust my colleague, uh, Jeff Lehman, to bring us up. Mr. Sunshine. <laughs> um, let me thank uh, Robbie for a wonderful presentation. And I'll also put in a plug. If you are not on the email list of the organization that he has founded, the PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute, I would encourage you to do so. If you're interested in all in these themes, they just do a wonderful job of um, presenting timely data. Um, they often point to interesting articles where their work is being cited. Um, it's just, it, it's a well worth your time to uh, sign up for that. So, and I'm not being paid by PR. Thank you for that. Can I make one quick plug? To, we also have internships that are paid. So um, check out the website if you're interested. Yeah. There you go. Well, um, I thought because I just can't help myself, that I would start with a story. And to tell this story, I have to reveal two things about myself. One right away, and the second will come in a moment. The first is that even though I teach at Notre Dame, I am not Catholic. I was actually raised in the Mormon tradition, 
or Latter-day Saints. Mormon is sort of on the outs as a term now, so now we're... Um, today, um, my relationship to Mormonism is, as they say on Facebook, complicated. <laughs> <laughs> but I did grow up Mormon. And so I grew up in a tradition that um, by some measures would be off the charts with the, the, the themes, if not the specific questions, but the theme of Christian nationalism. So Mormons believe that the United States Constitution is divinely ordained. Um, that has presented some complications for church leaders, one of whom is actually a constitutional law scholar. Uh, he's spoken on this because sometimes the Mormons will be pressed on this. Does that mean like every word of the Constitution is divinely inspired? Like, what about the three-fifths compromise? What about the amendments? What about the, the, the amendment, for example, to repeal prohibition? Mormons don't drink alcohol. You might think God would also want people not to drink alcohol. And so the you know, sort of rough answer is, well, God inspired the process by which the Constitution was formed and whatnot. So that's the world I grew up in. And I, I remember um, as a child in church, we would, as a hymn, we'd sing America the Beautiful. And I remember um, Sunday school lessons where we'd learn about the divinely ordained Constitution of the United States. Here comes the second interesting fact about myself. I am from Canada. <laughs> All of what I just described to you was taught to me as a Canadian. And I was a bit of a precocious child. And so I remember, this is, a, this is an absolutely true story. I remember sitting in church once and I was thinking about this and I was really agonizing over it because I was Canadian. And in school, I learned about, see, you all in American schools learn about the revolutionaries and you celebrate the American Revolution. We call them the disloyalists. <laughs> and we talk about the loyalists who came north and, you know, still venerated the monarch. So I kind of thought, well, in the Re American Revolution, I would have been on the side of the British, right? I'm Canadian. And I remember going up to my father and saying, I just can't make any sense out of this. How can I be a Canadian and a Mormon? And he said, what are you talking about? <laughs> this is ridiculous. Um, but it sort of plagued me. I mentioned that because um, I would like to suggest, and this might be a bit of a provocative statement given the context of the conversation here, but I would like to suggest that there are some aspects of what we now call Christian nationalism that can actually be benign if by Christian nationalism you mean that we should uphold the values inscribed within the founding documents of the United States. If we think of the United States as a country that aspires to its, its greatest goals and ambitions as articulated by Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and Martin Luther King and, and people like that. Because that was sort of the world I grew up in, that, well, yeah, there was this idea that America had some things going for it, but it didn't mean that America was necessarily the dominant player on the world stage. It didn't necessarily mean that everything America did was great. It instead, I would like to think, led people to pause and reflect on just what it meant to be American. And if that meant that there were certain values that you held that you thought your country should also subscribe to, maybe there were some positives there. But of course, we don't live in that world anymore. Now we live in a world where the themes that Robbie has just very nicely articulated for us are frankly frightening. The idea that there would be people who would not only look to America as a place that upholds values that they um, view as a priority, but instead a, a, they, they have a worldview where they're willing to take up arms to defend some notion of America as a you know, monochromatic nation, not only in terms of religion, but perhaps in terms of race. That's frightening. And how did that happen? Well, I would suggest to you that these things do not happen by accident, and that what has happened in the United States is that both religious and political leaders, and increasingly those can be one and the same, have sought to cultivate this idea that America is not just a nation that has a lot of people in it who are Christians, but that America is defined by its Christianity and by many of the other things that were pointed out today, uh, 
America has been defined perhaps by uh, a particular vision of the way those uh, values are enforced in law. Which is a reminder to all of us that um, what is said by those who lead, either in politics or in religion, truly matters. And so as a country, we are now in a dilemma. As Professor Lehman has described, we are polarized. We have a growing secular population. We have a Christian nationalist population that may not be growing, but is very vocal and is concentrated in one party and within one wing of that one party. And I'm not suggesting that there's an easy way out of this, but it is a reminder that, again, these things do not happen by accident. And America has actually been through periods in its past where it has also seemed to be veering toward either civil conflict, of course, we've experienced that in the country, or in other ways has seemed to be headed in one direction, and then things change. How those changes occur, well, that varies on the historical period. But again, they don't happen by accident. So I guess my message is, if you care about Christian nationalism, and I'm guessing, given where we are, that at least some of you in this group are yourselves religious, you should remember that um, if, if, if you are frightened about this kind of thing, that you need to be a spokesperson for the way you think these values that America upholds should be articulated, that America should be a pluralistic and diverse place. It doesn't mean that people don't respect religion, of course they do, but it also means that there should be enough space for those who believe otherwise or maybe do not have religious belief at all. And I am, I suppose, naive enough to believe that if enough people in America actually reinforce that message again and again and again, it is possible for the country to veer back into a direction that it once was on. So I will leave it with that, and we'll open it up. I believe great. it's Q&A. Unless yeah. you wanna, no, that's great. You want to rebut? No, no, I think it's a good place to, yeah, open it up. It, it, I, I just want to say w one thing. <laughs> I, I don't disagree with anything that my Canadian colleague has said. Uh, but it's not just Mormons who believe that the Constitution and the Declaration of, Pen of Independence and the founding are sort of divinely inspired. Uh, a lot of our founding generation did, and even those who are not really Christians, like Washington and, and maybe even John Adams, um, in contrast to their colleague Thomas Jefferson, who really was a strict separationist when it came to the relationship between church and state, they believed that a religious population really was good for um, sort of civic republicanism, of encouraging participation in civic life and encouraging the sort of moral compass and values needed for democracy. Um, and, and so they built this strong tradition of civil religion in which America was seen as very connected to a godly plan. But throughout most of our history, that has been pursued in a, in a unifying way, one nation under God um, in the Pledge of Allegiance, of a way that in sort of encourages this idea of pluralism and America as a land of immigrants. But we've seen that that same sort of connection of religion to um, things like tolerance and pluralism and democracy um, has an ugly side too and can be pushed in different directions by different kinds of political leaders. And so I think uh, what, what Dave said is very true. Um, these values, this thinking has always been there, but it can take a very positive turn or a very ugly turn depending on how it's framed by our political elites. So again, on that happy note, um, that was happier, though. Thank you. <laughs> we, we will turn it over for Q&A. All right, so I'll be leading the moderated Q&A. So be stewing on your questions, and I see there are already a few. We do have one prepared that we wanted to ask all of our, all of our panelists. But first, let's give them a round of applause and thank them for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that was incredible. So tonight we discussed Christian nationalism and the soul of America, two very large subjects. I want to bring it a bit closer to home. Um, and I would like to ask for our panelists' insight on a viral photo that emerged on January 6th, 2021, amid the riot 
at the US Capitol. I can pull it out. I actually have it on my phone. We can do show and tell here in a second. And in this photo, you see a number of flags and symbols that featured heavily in the footage of that day, burned in our memory of the event. But what stands out in this particular photo is a navy blue flag with gold lettering that reads, God, country, Notre Dame. And it features our game day ND logo. These are symbols of our university, our traditions, and even of our very identity as a religious educational institution. And of course, behind the flag, you can see rioters ascending the scaffolding to the Capitol. So given what we've discussed tonight, how do we, how do we at Notre Dame seriously reckon with this prominent symbol of our university community and our identity being part of the imagery at such an event? And how do we as a community meaningfully reconcile and move forward? For the experts. <laughs> uh, well, I can't talk too much about the Notre Dame flag, but I did write a piece because um, I was so horrified by what I saw on January 6th. I was up late that night writing a piece that published on January 7th at Religion News Service about, um, but what struck me was two flags that were very familiar to me uh, showing up on January 6th. And so I grew up um, uh, mostly in Jackson, Mississippi as a Southern Baptist, right? So part of that white evangelical world in the deep South, there were two flags that were very familiar to me from my childhood. Um, one of them was the Confederate flag uh, that was very prominent and all over the place. Um, the other one was a Protestant Christian flag um, that is white and it has a blue canton with a red Latin cross up in the corner. Uh, and that flag was behind the pulpit at my local Baptist church every Sunday, right? There were two flags behind the pulpit, an American flag and the Christian flag. Um, and it was the, we, we said the Pledge of Allegiance to the Christian flag during vacation Bible school uh, growing up. And that was the flag that was marching right behind the Confederate flag, right? In lockstep into the breach capital um, that day. And I remember like being so deeply disturbed like by that um, uh, what I, I think I called it an unholy amalgamation, um, you know, in that in that piece that I wrote, um, uh, those things together, and I, I think it's it's um, it's really important that, we, that I, I titled the piece um, "Taking the the Christian Symbols uh, at the Insurrection Seriously," because so many commentators were just kind of flying by uh, the Christian symbols and not really paying it, but those people took the time to bring that six foot cross, drag it up to the, uh, to the Capitol, to wear that t-shirt uh, with the Bible verse on it, to have that patch sewn on their jacket with the, uh, with the Bible verse on it, to, and to wave the flag, right? Uh, Trump is my president, Jesus is my savior, um, all kinds of Christian. There's one in that photo right there that I, that I have on the, um, uh, that's actually January 6th, right? And, um, uh, and up, up there right now. Um, and so I, I think it's really important that we take that seriously, that that was not an incidental Right, part of what was going on that day, and and how and what was animating uh, folks. Go ahead. <laughs> <That's the point. laughs> um, I think the uh, the fact that the God Country and Notre Dame flag was on display on January sixth um, reinforces, I hope, the message that I. Um, trying to deliver tonight to a Notre Dame audience, which is, it is easy to sit through a presentation like this and say, oh, that's a white evangelical thing. Mm -hmm. And there are, of course, some evangelical Christians at Notre Dame, but let's face it, predominantly Catholic, obviously. Um, but the fact is, even though you find this group concentrated among white evangelicals, they're not exclusively white evangelicals. You'll find them in other religious traditions as well, including Catholicism. And one reaction is to just throw up your hands in despair and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. But quite another is for those who care about your tradition and about your university to display to the world that that person, whoever that was waving that flag, does not actually represent what Notre Dame is really about. And the only way that can happen is for those who are students and alumni of this university to take seriously the need to engage with these issues and that means uncomfortable conversations, but that's what it means. And um, you know, if, if people aren't willing to have those, then the, the alternative is the vocal crowd, the ones who are waving the flags, they will come to represent 
this university and perhaps even Roman Catholicism in America. And I suspect that many, not only in this room, but around the country would not be happy with that. Uh, I am also chair of the political science department. So if I was a smart man, I would pass on this question. <laughs> not being that smart, I'm gonna take a stab at it. Um, I, I think what Professor Campbell just said, it sort of sums it up, but um, you know, I, I think it's a very apt question because like America, Notre Dame has a lot of symbolic value to people. People uh, read a lot into Notre Dame and what it stands for and want it to stand for what they stand for um, because it, we are not only America's most prominent Catholic university, we're kind of America's most prominent Christian university. So um, we don't know that the person who had that flag was actually a Catholic or not. Um, but I think it reinforces the points that we've made about um, religious values and a connection between Christianity or religion, belief in God, uh, and institutions like government and higher education that are not always connected to religion, those can be turned in a way for the good or, or for ill. Um, you know, Notre Dame's commitment to uh, uh, not only Catholicism, but understanding the role of religion in the world is part of the reason that a lot of us are here. Um, I think we have three non-Catholics sitting up here, but I know at least, I, well, we, we do, because Robbie just talked about the Protestant flag. Uh, <laughs> the reason Professor Campbell and I are here is because of Notre Dame's commitment to faith and therefore the commitment to religion. And a lot reason a lot of our faculty who are non-Catholic and a lot of our students who are non-Catholic are here is because the values of the Catholic Church and Notre Dame's mission um, promotes things like science, understanding, tolerance, diversity, um, you know, support for the environment, um, support for uh, human rights, human development, helping people who are disadvantaged. Um, and so it, it's the Catholic values of the university that attract a ton of people here uh, on both the left and the right and both Catholics and non-Catholics, but at the same time, it's easy to take those values and say, we are an exclusively Catholic university and we must abide by exactly what pre-Vatican II Catholicism says um, and, and twist that. And it's only through um, inspired leadership who takes the values of the university in the right directions and not the wrong directions that we will remain the university that stands for what a lot of us think it ought to stand for and, and is the reason why we're here. Thank you. Let's open, up some, open it up for some questions. Sorry, on this side. Uh, thank, first of all, thank you for a fantastic thought-provoking uh, conversation that I think needs to be had here at Notre Dame. I, I'm glad that Nick uh, began the question focusing on the first part of uh, how we build this, this, uh, this program. I actually want to take you to the second part of it, where uh, cha uh, it's changing Christianity, no, uh, American Christianity and a changing America. It's that changing America part, right? So we've heard about changes in religion, values, what have you, and how it's tied into certain views. But if we really contemplate the, the history of the U.S. is... So socially, economically, and politically, you can tie it into various inflection points. The Civil War, Civil Rights, and I would say the moment we're in right now, these are different inflection points that are driven by the influx of African Americans as an enfranchised uh, community, at least in theory, uh, during the Civil War, after the Civil War. Civil Rights, and the dramatic demographic change. I don't think that we should talk about this changing America as just something that's happening as religious values are, are happening, but I would argue that it's actually in reaction to the changing America. The, the increased secularization, the changes in the uh, 
um, Christian nationalists or the, the, the growth is precisely because of that change in America. So I want to push the three of you to discuss that a little bit more because it's, it's conversations like that that need to be had and it's going on in, in campuses as well. We're, it's not just something that's happening in the country. Dialogues that are happening in the elite universities is in reaction to those changing demographics. All right, well, I'll jump in. Thank you uh, for that. Uh, so one of the reasons why I spent so much time at the beginning talking about these changing demographics, and I do want to just kind of put a fine point on it, um, it's not just uh, the decline of uh, white people in America. It's not just the decline of Christian identity in America. It's, it's the combined piece of this that I think has caused what I sometimes like almost sort of tongue-in-cheek, but not really, it's sometimes maybe the best technical term for it, uh, the great uh, conservative white Christian freakout moment that we're having, right, in the country today, um, is because uh, there has always been this vision that America, uh, and I'll just say this as someone who was brought up in this world, belonged to us, right? That's what's at the center of it, right? And now there's the sense that, oh, wait a minute, uh, not only can we not really, we don't have the political clout to make that claim anymore, but the country doesn't even look like us um, uh, anymore or believe like us uh, anymore. And I think it's that sense of things. If you think about like the KKK, the rise of the, in, the 20, in the 20th century, early 1920s, um, it was a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant movement. Right? And what they were about was reclaiming an America that was white, Anglo-Saxon, and Protestant, Christian. That's why it was anti-Jewish and anti-Catholic uh, at the turn of the century. Like, it was that vision of the country, and it's about ownership. It really is. It's like everyone else is kind of, I mean, even FDR, uh, for goodness sake, uh, who I think many liberals you know, hold up, as a, said, like, you know, this is a, 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 a white Christian country. Everybody else is here by sufferance. Um, and so there's that sense of, um, of things. And I think that's what we're really struggling over is whose country is it? Who's a real American? Uh, right? Those kinds of questions are much more important than any policy differences that we're, we're seeing um, uh, today. I mean, for goodness sake, the Republican Party dropped all pretense of even having a political platform uh, in 2020. Right? And I think part of that is because that's not what the fight's about. Um, the fight's about who, who we are as a country and who we're going to be um, as a country. I think that's why it's so visceral. Um, a, a, as well. Um, but, but I think it goes, the last thing I'll say is I, I do think it's that ethno-religious identity that is really the, the fire um, here that we really have to pay attention to it. Um, and it, it's very, very deep. I mean, if you, you know, the, the version of Christianity that landed on the shores of this continent from Europe was not democratic, right? It was not, right? So we were struggling to kind of like shoehorn this anti-democratic colonial Christianity into a democratic form, right? And that's been the American struggle, like from the beginning. Um, you know, the, the, uh, I walked down today the murals that, uh, you know, were covered up uh, here and, and, and this whole debate on campus, right, about, about that. But the one in particular that had Columbus with this big cross planted in the ground and Native Americans gathered around, there's actually one very similar to that in the U.S. Capitol Rotunda um, that's still there. Uh, uh, today, uh, but that was a very particular claiming of land, right, by European Christian powers with the blessing um, uh, of the leader of the Western Church, the Pope, um, and it was about claiming this space as a kind of promised land uh, for European Christians. So that last question that I put up there is probably the oldest uh, sentiment in the DNA that we've, and we've never fully answered that question. Are we really going to claim that, that America is a kind of promised land for European Christians, and everybody else has to just find their place, um, or are we a pluralistic democracy? And I think we're still struggling to answer that, that question. Um, why don't we move to some student questions? Question over here. Um, <clears throat> uh, hello, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, this is a question of the entire panel, but I'll begin with something I heard Professor Campbell say last semester. Um, <laughs> uh oh. <laughs> that, uh, more than anything in modern America, um, religiosity uh, is a greater determinant of political sort of action than individual religious affiliation. Uh, and as we just saw, the number of sort of white evangelical adherence to Christian nationalism is falling. Um, is now less than a majority, and so it's obvious that, at least on a national scale, outside of their individual localities, they're unable to achieve their objectives on their own. So 
My question then is on sort of a national scale. Um, are politicians disguising Christian nationalist objectives uh, and sort of framing them in secular terms uh, to sort of rope in other sympathetic people who may not be Christian nationalists necessarily, but they're part of a new wave of right-wing politics in the United States uh, that is secular. I'm thinking most recently an example in Florida, uh, as we saw yesterday with the you know, new educational uh, restrictions. Are people like Governor Ron DeSantis intentionally avoiding Christian nationalist rhetoric to rope in other, sympathi <clears throat> other sympathizers and what could also very clearly be construed as Christian nationalist objectives? That's true. Yeah, you started this. <laughs> well, um, this is the way I would put it. Less, I think it's less that um, politicians, whether it's Ron DeSantis or we could name a number of others um, who I think share similar philosophies, I think it's less that they are disguising their Christian nationalism and more that they are portraying themselves as culture warriors and so taking on issues that really resonate within this group of Christian nationalists, but not exclusively among Christian nationalists. And what's so interesting to me about so many Republican politicians, and this is mostly a, a Republican thing, is how many will use the language of the embattled religious minority even though in their own lives there isn't a lot of evidence that they themselves are terribly devout or that religion has been an important part of their lives. I mean, I don't need to tell you that Donald Trump, prior to his emergence as a political candidate, not actually known as an especially devout guy. Um, and I would say that that is a relatively new thing in American politics because in the past when you had politicians who would talk about religion, typically it's because they really did come from a religious background. When Jimmy Carter talked about his religion, Jimmy Carter was sincere about that. And whatever you might think of George W. Bush, there's really no evidence that I'm aware of that he actually wasn't sincere about the religion that he professed. Now, you may not have agreed with it or not like the way that, you know, that led him to make particular policy decisions, but by all indications, he, he was sincere. I don't see so much of that now. What I see now is an expectation, particularly in the GOP, that if you're going to run for office and be a serious candidate, then you have to at least give lip service to very evangelical sounding language, whether you yourself are an evangelical or not. And that in turn resonates well within this group of Christian nationalists that we've been talking about today. Uh, very good answer. Very, very good question. Um, yeah, I, I think um, I, I think these themes, like um, you know, anti CRT, along with banning particular books for being immoral, um, I think they all sort of conglomerate together in a way where you're you have the convergence of race and religion, which is why uh, Robbie wrote a, a really great book called The End of White Christian America. And I, I think Professor Ramirez's question was spot on that it's, and, and Robbie's answer was spot on that it's, it's not just Christianity, it's not just race, it's that the country doesn't belong to us anymore and it belongs to them and them are people who are not white and, and also are not Christian. Um, I think these themes can appeal to certain constituencies really well um, in, in, when applied in secular terms. Um, one of the things that's, that was really interesting about Donald Trump's early support in 2016 was that his support among evangelicals was much stronger among evangelicals who don't attend church very much than it was among evangelicals um, who do attend often. Um, you know, whatever you think of J.D. Vance, uh, he wrote a really good book, Hillbilly Elegy, and he, he talked about um, Christianity and religion and religious symbolism being so important to his family, but they never darkened the door of the church. Uh, and in fact, 
Professor Campbell and I, in our book, we, we have a category of people that we call the mammals because they, that was uh, J.D. Vance's grandma, who was devoutly religious um, but never attended church. I think, in a way, these things... I, I was actually a little surprised to see the evidence that um, there's a pretty strong relationship between religious attendance and Christian nationalism because there's also been a lot of work about sort of cultural... Uh, religion or cultural evangelicalism, and in some ways these appeals, the Christian nationalists before it was the alt-right, really appeal most to people for whom uh, their evangelicalism or their Christianity is more of a symbol of their identity and who they are, but they're not really reading the scripture or attending mass or, or services. Um, so I think the language needs to be somewhat secular for a broader audience because it appeals to these kinds of ideas of them versus us without getting too much into the theology that may be at the core of Christian nationalism. So it's appealing to people who might believe in Christian nationalism and, and related goals, but not in a way that bogs it down with a lot of theology and religion, God talk, that only people who might be weekly attenders would really understand. Okay, so in your presentation, you talked about how the people who tend to adhere to Christian national ideology don't really shy away from claiming the term mm. Christian nationalism. And so I guess my question is, when the media is perpetually talking about Christian nationalism, Christian nationalists did this, did that, even if it's in a negative sense, um, do you think in a way that's perpetuating Christian, na Christian nationalism um, by creating a group for them or anyone who says, well, I fit into that ideology, maybe I should join that group as well? Is it like perpetuating that? And would it be better if you know, there's more of a focus, you know, January 6th, you can't ignore that kind of an event, but rather than saying over and over and over again what they're doing, or is that my my view of that kind of like ignoring the problem and trying to say, well, push it away and hope it goes away. Like, what do you think the solution would be for that? Would it be better for the media to stop talking about it so much, even if it is a negative, in a negative light? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And I was on a call last week where this was being debated um, uh, with, with some folks um, about whether... Uh, it's perpetuating the, the, the problem. Um, I, I tend to think that, uh, here's the thing, if it were actually a new phenomenon, I think this is really a new name for this older phenomenon, right? So it has a new manifestation, a new kind of branding, uh, but that branding is not just like from without, it's also from within. Um, and, and we need, I think, when there's something... Um, sort of on the horizon, whether you're talking about like the Tea Party or the Christian right, like all of these are invented labels, right, that we use to kind of talk about a phenomenon that's bubbling up. And we as academics, we find labels for things, right, to talk about them. But we kind of need a handle, right, in order to kind of like hold on to it and say, oh, well, this is it. Um, but I think it's important to be precise, which is one of the reasons why we try to say, when we say Christian nationalism, we mean these five attitudes, right? That's what we mean. Uh, by that, and we're not just kind of throwing the label around because I think where we get into trouble um, is sort of what Professor Campbell was saying. If we mean any kind of religious representation in the public square or any kind of religious influence on politics, then we're in trouble because that, that's clearly not what we mean by Christian nationalism here. Um, I tend not to think that certainly we academics have that much power, um, uh, right? That it, I think it's better to be clear about this, and I am really loath to kind of go anywhere near a Nazi analogy, but I, I don't think it, it would have been, it would have uh, been fitting, you know, for people to say, well, let's not use the word fascist, let's not use the word Nazi, because it might generate more of them. Um, I don't think it's really the way it works at the end of the day. So I think we're better off being clear-eyed about saying, this is what we mean, and, and defining it very clearly, but, um, so we're not being loose about it, uh, or just using it to say anything we don't like. Right, any any kind of conservative Christianity. If you're liberal, we're going to call it Christian nationalism, and now just dismiss it. Right, so we can't do that. We've got to be really careful uh, about that. But if we're talking about um, something that's essentially, um, you know, has white supremacy at its core and Christian domination at its core, right? That's a fundamentally anti-democratic worldview, and I think we do have to kind of call that out. But. All right, so we're. 
going to have one last question. Let y'all take parting words. But on the theme of our th series, right, Andy Democracy Talks, we want to engage the Notre Dame community with critical conversations about not only the state of American democracy, but also what it means to take ownership over our democracy and our democratic system. So given our discussion and the themes that we've discussed, and this is for each speaker to give parting words, what does it mean to take ownership over the present state and future of our, of our democratic system and to defend democracy like a champion today? <laughs> Sister Mary explains the world to you, the scene, right? It's like, next, right? <laughs> next question. Do you want to take that one? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just talking. Um, those who have heard me preach, I mean teach before, will not be surprised at what I'm about to say. Um, it is easy to come out of a conversation like this and say, there's nothing we can do. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. But that is exactly the wrong reaction that you should have. The reaction you should have is, America is moving in a direction, or at least some people in America are moving in a direction that could have profound consequences for the health of American democracy. And the only way to stop that, the only way to stand up for democracy is to be engaged in democracy. And that starts with voting, but it doesn't end with voting. Um, it means being engaged, as I was saying earlier, in conversations that you have with other people. It means that you get involved in the political arena. Find candidates that you support. Find causes that you support. Uh, because if you don't do that, th I assure you, there are other people <laughs> who are more than happy to fill the public square because they want to take America in a different direction. And they're not concerned about democracy. And I'll just close by noting, and I want to emphasize this, that if you really care about democracy with a lowercase d, so not the party, but the form of governance, that sometimes means you're going to lose. It sometimes means that the people you disagree with are going to win. That is also not a reason to leave the public square. It is all the more reason to stay in the public square, and perhaps even find what is good in the opponents so that you can build on some common ground. That's a lot harder to do than to say, but that's what it means to be part of a democracy. Why don't I go so that uh, Dr. Jones can have the, the last word. Um, I, I think what I would say is agreeing with everything that Professor Campbell just said is, um, from the standpoint of what we're talking about here today, Christian nationalism, um, I, I expect that this is a Catholic university. It's 85% Catholic, so I would assume a, a majority of people in this room identify as Catholic or Christian. I think it's very important for Christians to be involved in politics, but not just involved in one party supporting one ideology and one faction of one party, because what happens there is is usually bad stuff and it's as bad for uh religion as it is for politics you know thomas jefferson uh said that he preferred a high wall of separation of church and state because um the state is worse even worse for religion than religion is for the state and and professor campbell and i have evidence and others have evidence of that that uh, politics has been a driver a pusher of people out of religion because people have come to see religion as equaling Republican and conservative, and that should not be, and I don't think it can be, to counteract things like Christian nationalism. Um, and since I'm, I've been a Notre Dame partisan, I'll also be a South Bend partisan and say one of the things I really liked about Pete Buttigieg's campaign in 2020 was that unlike the vast majority of Democratic politicians who are scared to death of God talk, uh, Mayor Pete directly, mm -hmm. emphatically engaged in God talk in support of political progressivism. And, and I don't want to be a partisan for progressivism or conservatism, but if people of faith from across the political spectrum are actively advocating for democracy, then we don't get... Went out for some um, we don't get... I'll just talk. 
Um, <laughs> We don't get this perceived connection between Christianity and white nationalism, which is really terrible both for America and for Christianity. Great. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be brief. I know we're, we're past time, but thank you all for your patience and for being here. Um, the, I think I'll just echo a couple things. Um, if you're here and you're concerned about this problem, uh, American democracy needs you. Uh, so echo, echo uh, Dr. Campbell. Uh, here. Um, and uh, with that, I think the tendency is sometimes to throw up your hands or kind of just get so disgusted. It's, it's ugly. It's uh, depressing, you know, uh, but uh, to get, find a way to get involved, to get involved at the local level, um, uh, and it, it can actually make a difference. Um, there have those uncomfortable conversations. You obviously have to pick when and where, um, you know, and how often you, you have the stamina to have them, but try to have them. Um, I have plenty of these in my own family. Uh, right, uh, we have a kind of very mixed family uh, uh, in my family. It's most of which are down uh, in either Mississippi or Alabama. Um, so try to find ways to have those conversations, or kind of bear witness in some ways, even if it's not a direct conversation uh, to a different vision. But I think the American democracy definitely needs people of faith who are willing to stand up and say, "No, actually, this, right, uh, this, this supportive of a pluralistic uh, democracy. Here's how we see our faith supporting that vision." Because otherwise. Uh, conceding the public square to this other vision of Christianity is not good for democracy. It's sure not good for Christianity, right? If we if we think about uh, wanting the health of the church uh, or a healthy church um, in this country, um, which is something I care about um, as well. Um, I, I, I'm going to end with like a, a comment uh, from James Baldwin, who was kind of central to me in writing the last book um, and really helping shape my. Um, uh, thinking, and, you know, uh, he was a, a, a gay black man uh, writing, you know, through the 60s, 70s, and 80s, right? So some pretty tough times, uh, uh, and, you know, I think always held out hope, um, and a couple things that have stayed with me from him, which I think sometimes when we're feeling like the forces arrayed against us are big, um, is, you know, he just said, look, you know, what, what I always hold out hope is that um, I always believe that people can be and do better, like, it's that simple, right? Um, and that, that we have a role to play in helping that to be, uh, helping that to be true. And then these um, uh, words that he said about, like, telling the truth, right? Telling the truth about our history um, and, and the, the, in a way that can help us see where we're going uh, to a different kind of um, uh, history, a more pluralistic, more democratic, more equal uh, society. I mean, he basically said if we could have the courage, uh, and for Baldwin, it was courage and love. If we could have the courage and love to do that, right, to take those stands, uh, and these are his words, he said, we can end the racial nightmare, we can achieve our country, and we can change the history of the world. Right, um, that's somebody from like who really struggled through some pretty tough times in American history. But I, I find that um, uh, I, I agree that this is a this is a you know I, I'm I'm turning 55 this year. Um, I would say in my lifetime, the moment we're in feels like a hinge point uh, to me, right? And it really is going to matter what happens in the next 10 years. Um, we get through 10 or 12 years, the demographics are going to shift quite dramatically. But in these next 10 years, what's left standing at the next uh, 10 years from now is an open question, because uh, I, I think it's, it's going to be a challenge. And so we'll need all the voices we can. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I hope that you found this talk to be insightful. You gained a little bit of knowledge and some takeaways that you can go out and be champions of democracy. To the students who are here, um, if you are here and you um, were working with the professor to get extra credit or as part of your requirements for your course, there is a sign-in sheet in the back. Um, if you are interested in engaging further in these sorts of discussions, we have a fellowship program um, that you can find more information on that on the Rooney Center's website. It's rooneycenter.nd.edu. And please join me in thanking our panelists once again. And just one quick reminder well, before you all disperse, um, uh, the, the internship uh, is at prri.org. We usually have a couple of interns fall, spring, and summer. Um, so we're taking applications kind of all the time. So if you're interested in kind of coming to DC and having a paid internship there, and one last small self-serving uh, shameless promotion department, um, uh, if you're interested in kind of following along, I, I write uh, weekly at Substack. Uh, it's robertpjones.substack.com. If any of you, it's free, free newsletter, uh, no paywall. Uh, so I would welcome any of you along the way. So. Yeah.